Hello and welcome to the eTalking podcast from Motion E, the place to be for features on electric vehicles, Formula E and sustainable transport. I'm Stuart Garlick. Now, today I have a long interview, but it's long for a reason because we got on so well and we had such a tremendous time doing it with uh, the person that you probably know as Hayley Mulch. Her full name is Hayley Mulcahy. She's an artist from Ireland and she's drawn and painted all of your favourite motorsport heroes and she's also got her very own comic series. Well, several in fact, under the Paradiso banner, which uh, we'll be talking to her about. This interview was recorded before the suspension of all motorsport. She's created all of these fantastic virtual worlds for us and now it's all about delving into them. So, um, on with the podcast. Now, normally at this stage I would talk about Patreon, but I have suspended Patreon payments for the next month at least because of the uh, crisis in public health around the world and because... Frankly, there isn't a lot of money for most people, so people need to look after their cash. So uh, hopefully that helps a little bit, but I want to thank so much uh, my Patreon subscribers. Uh, you know who you are, but uh, you've, you've been really good in uh, helping out the publication and helping it to grow and helping it to move forward. And there will be more exclusive content in the future, but for now... Let's all look after ourselves and stay safe. Anyway, on with the podcast, and here is Hayley Mulcahy talking to me. Hayley Mulcahy, uh, welcome to the podcast. Hi, how are you? Very good, very good. We've just had a chat before recording about uh, various things that we could talk about, mm. and um, you have a really interesting hobby because uh, you're you're an artist and you're a cartoonist and um, you draw and paint about motorsports quite a lot of the time. Uh, you probably do other stuff as well. Um, maybe maybe it would be good to give a short introduction to yourself. So, um, how did you get into art generally? Have you always been doing it? Yeah, uh, pretty much. So, um, I started drawing actually since I was six. And what inspired me was um, anime, as a lot of people, I suppose, these days. Um, the anime in particular uh, that inspired me was Sailor Moon, when it used to be on Fox Kids back in the late 90s. And just immediately, like, all the colours and the sparkles and the characters, something about it just blew my mind as a six-year-old. And I was just like... You know, it was so beautiful. And then one day I was just like, I want to try draw this character. So I did. And I kept drawing Sailor Moon and other characters. And then that evolved. I, I've always been a fan of video games and other cartoons. So I would just, I just developed by drawing my favorite characters. So uh, Ed, Ed and Eddie, I, I mentioned it to you earlier, like, uh, that's, that was like my favourite cartoon back in the day, uh, Sonic the Hedgehog as well, my favourite video game character. And like the more and more I drew what I loved pretty much in terms of like all these cartoons, it began then giving me the inspiration to see, can I design characters? Can I draw my own concepts and illustrations? And I kept going pretty much all the way um what year was it when I started dabbling in um, digital art? Um, like I, I was drawing continuously all that time when it was like 2005, 2006, I began sharing my art online pretty much. You know, I joined like DeviantArt. It was like my first uh, proper place to show off my art. And it was about 2007, 2008 then I was doing digital art. I like I, I asked for my parents, like, can I get one of those like newfangled digital drawing tablets from Wacom and things like that? And I did. And I just kept going then ever since. And pretty much like I get into phases of things I really like and what, what I've loved. Um all the way throughout my time drawing and creating art was 
all the different things I ended up getting into. So as I said, I mentioned like Sailor Moon, I loved Ed, Ed and Eddie, I loved Sonic the Hedgehog. And uh, when I got to my teens, and this probably was kind of the, um, I, I would like to say the seeds that planted for how I got into like motorsports, I suppose, was that I was a massive Top Gear fan. I love Top Gear. So I was like, uh, I actually was one of those people that would draw fan art of Jeremy Clarkson, Richard Hammond and James May. <laughs> no word of a lie. I had the biggest crush on Richard Hammond because he had that spiky style hair. And like as a young weeaboo child, I was like, oh, he's like my anime cartoons in real life. So cringe like, but Shawahar, it was all fun and games. Um but yeah, I would try actually like drawing cars and stuff, not great and not often, but you know, or whatever kind of memes came out of Top Gear. I even did a fan comic, oh, no, which got really? a bit popular. I did. I, it got a bit popular, um, but it's, oh, I have a hard time showing it now to me. <laughs> But um, I mean, at the time, I was well proud of it. Like, and I, uh, I connected with like other people online, you know, that enjoyed it because they were, you know, uh, part of enjoying Top Gear, like this Top Gear fandom. And it was actually around that two thousand and eight, two thousand nine period um, of being in that fandom when I first designed a particular character, a hmm. particular character that. I do share a lot and I'm now actually making my web comic out of um, that character's name Tiffany, Tiffany Pardee. So that's actually when I first designed her and originally she was uh, a robot kind of like designed as like this kind of crash test dummy android thing. I, I was well into robots as well at that time, like Mega Man and stuff. And I was designing other robot characters kind of mm. like merging my love of like Mega Man and Sonic the Hedgehog and Star Fox and things like that. So um, that all developed. But then I fell out with Top Gear for a while, got a little under interested. At Around that time, I was kind of looking in a bit more at F1. Uh, I do remember uh, being on the couch. I think it was... I think it was the Brazil race where Hamilton claimed his first world title. Um, I was actually sketching something on the couch I think while my dad had it on and was watching it so I kind of didn't pay too much attention but I you know I was over here and oh like Lewis Hamilton you know youngest F1 world championship first uh, black world champion you know and it was awesome and that always stuck with my head and I was like oh my god that's so cool you know um but I, I again I wasn't kind of closely following it um oh to go back a small bit, um, I do remember F1 from like the early 2000s, like mm. going up uh, every Sunday to my nan's house. We would have the family dinner. So my mom, dad, my two older brothers, uh, my uh, my great aunt, God rest her soul, and my nan. Um, and the, the F1 would be on, you know. So like even back then, like I knew the names like Schumacher, Barrichello, Coulthard, uh, Alonso, you know, Hacken, and I, I was like aware of those names, even though I could go ages for, forgetting about Formula One entirely, but I just always knew like about Michael and Ralph Schumacher and Fernando Alonso <laughs> and things like that, you know, it was just like, oh yeah, I know, I know who they are, I know who they are, and I always remember, like, my dad had a Jordan hat as well, I mean, come on, you know, Irish F1 team, you, you kind of have to, like, the old Benson yeah. and Hatches yellow livery hat but yeah um early 2010s went by i was i paid no attention to any motorsport or cars whatever i was into other things i got loads of other inspirations i grew a love of indian cinema um hmm. other yeah um i do love my bollywood films and south asian films they're they're really really good um and just a whole bunch of different things until it was about 2015 then that I decided I, I kind of came back to my character Tiffany and I was kind of starting to see could I just dabble around with more concepts for her because I was at that time I was kind of starting to like really like I was out of college 
I finished college in 2014. I did two years of animation and one year illustration in like, um, it wasn't a university or an IT. It was like a, a third level kind of community college would be kind of like the level of it. It was like a, a level six certificate, you know, I got. Hmm. Um, it was grand, like, you know, it was after that, I just kind of wanted to do my own thing and create my own things then, you know, so it was grand. But um, yeah, I had really wanted to, like, there's a big scene here at the moment in Ireland with uh, comic book artists and writers a lot of people have gotten really big here such as will sliney from cork he works with marvel uh doing spider-man uh, a friend of mine triana farrell is a colorist for big names like idw boom marvel she does a ton of comics and a lot of my other friends too were um publishing their own stuff and like i really wanted to do that you know I was like because I did want to make comics when I was a kid as well so I wanted to play around with like all concepts and old characters I'd made when I was younger and Tiffany was one of them and, and I was starting to develop and actually research into how you actually get into motorsport that was like my first time I actually like went on to Google and I was like how does one become an F1 driver? And I was like, okay, you start off with karting, then you, oh my God, all that money you have to pay. Oh boy. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> and so it was, it was like, damn, that, you know, that, that would be a challenging story to write, but, you know, it would be cool. And I kind of left it on the back burner again for another few years until 2017 when I randomly watched an episode of Top Gear that I had never seen before. Now, the thing is, I'm not going to say what episode of Top Gear it was because it is spoilers, actually, for the comic. But it was that element that made me realize I can do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to give Tiffany a story of her trying to get into F1 and all the struggles she has before and even after getting into F1. And that was about April 2017. Started sketching her again, sketching more characters, designing. And that's when I actually started properly watching Formula One. So I kind of caught the first race I properly caught was Bahrain uh, 2017. I think I think Max Verstappen won that. So like there was a ton of new names I hadn't heard. Like, I knew Sebastian Vettel, I had known of him, Lewis was still there. Um, and I just actually started gradually following it. Now, I couldn't watch every race because my part-time job at the time, I was doing mostly weekend shifts. But I came back home one day and I had found out what happened in Azerbaijan, which was, ooh, a spicy old race between uh, <laughs> Vettel and Hamilton, you know. I mm. didn't watch the race in full, but, you know, uh, Fettel Ta Hamilton brake tested him. He knocked into him. Oh, bro yes, moments yes. all around. Yeah, that was that race. <laughs> and Ricardo won it. And when I saw who won it, I was like, I have heard the name Ricardo before. Because again, like my dad would be looking into F1 here and there sometimes, you know. So I had heard of a, a couple of the early 2010 drivers too. Uh, like I had even. I was even made aware of Sean Eric Fern and Paul DeResta and things like that. Mm. And I was just like, okay, I'm going to look into this Daniel Ricardo fella. He seems interesting. And then I did. And he pretty much kind of helped me solidify my love of F1. And from there, I watched every race religiously. And basically, the love of doing motorsport art came from the fact that I wanted to research about a comic I really wanted to write and a character I wanted to do something with from when I was younger, but actually developing into so much more, actually enjoying the sport, actually love seeing the cars, deliveries, learning how everything works, learning like the rules, the regulations. Like I, I'm not a technical person by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, just 
even getting a brief understanding of how these machines work and you know you learn about drs and chicanes and breaking stones all that jargon you know um mm. it just became a love I, I just got hooked i just got genuinely hooked on it and that's pretty much where it's led me now into today i'm still uh drawing artwork of my favorite drivers uh the web comic has now launched in 2017 now called paradiso i'm extremely slow with creating it but that's because i'm a one person team and i work a full-time job and it sucks so there is delays but at the same time i i'm not i i'm, I'm going at my own pace i have nerve damage in my drawing arm so it does make it really painful and sore and i'm not like i used to be like jealousy and everyone you know progress and making their names out there in the comic world, you know, and things like that. And I was like, no, nah, I've actually found something I love doing and drawing and it's to do with cars and racers. And I found that there's people that love my stuff and I love doing it. And I've made incredible friends, close friends out of it. I know I met my boyfriend. I met my current boyfriend out of doing it. And I'm not rushing, you know, for anyone anymore. I'm doing my own work at my own time and I'm loving it. I am loving doing motorsport art. So sorry if I rambled there, but that's pretty much the whole story. <laughs> no, it was it was actually really uh, pleasant because for the first time I've got to the 15 minute mark without asking a question. I'm really happy about that. <laughs> Class, that's good. I'm <laughs> glad to help. And there's there's so much there to drill down into, but maybe if mm. we begin with Tiffany, because she is the mm. basis, I think, for everything you've done in your artwork since then, based on what you've just said. Mm -hmm. So Tiffany is a robot, is that right? So I will tell you her origins. So when I first drew her, I did design her as being a robot in mind. That inspiration actually came from the Top Gear fan comic I did because I created the Stig in that comic to be like a, a robot as well, like to test cars and stuff like that. Like instead of using like a human, uh, like he could kind of really push the boundaries, like a very advanced test dummy, you know, things like that. So when I first designed Tiffany, it was inspired by that. But then she became a human but i still wanted to keep some of that kind of oh it's a hard one because i suppose you you might you might be able to imagine but basically to kind of keep some of that robot element within her that's all i'm gonna say i always wanted to keep that technology part uh, a part of her but as she is in the comic right now it's like starting off when she's actually like it started off when she's three years old and in the current pages she's seven years old or six about six or seven she she is a human she's completely human she was born uh she is reared by a single father She's from Cork Bay. Of course, she has to be because, like, I, I just, you know, I, I, probably a bit of a self-insert, maybe not really, but uh, like, she, she is personality-wise, she is inspired by, like, that's how infectious Daniel Ricardo's personality was. Because I, like, in general, I've never seen a sports person with such a happy-go-lucky demeanor as Daniel, like even across like, I could be watching like interviews from football players or, you know, whoever else, but Daniel will always like do it with a smile. He'll always laugh. He'll always joke around. And I just thought that was so cool. So I wanted to give Tiffany that. Also, given her the kind of go-to attitude of Sonic the Hedgehog. So you see, it's all coming back again. It's all mm, like mm. all those old inspirations. It, like when you're inspired by something, it'll never fully leave you, you know? So and yeah. you always want to take the best parts of what you love. And that's what I did with her really. So, yeah. And obviously 
even as an artist, uh, I'm sure you would agree it's reductive to focus on someone's appearance. But when you look at Daniel Ricardo, it's clear how much he's progressed as a person over the years because that's how mm. he's progressed in his appearance. Um, I was looking mm. back at a photo of him uh, driving the HRT at Silverstone when he made his debut mm. in 2012. And um, compare that to now, you know, at the time he had, well, I'm not going to say bad teeth, but teeth like teeth like mine and everybody else's, you know, sli- slightly yellowing, mm. um, you know, uh, teeth that are shaved off at the end. And um, yeah. now, um, you know, he's got this perfect set of Hollywood Nashers and he's, uh, <laughs> you know, he's 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 got the permatan and he's got the sort of uh, um, slightly, slightly unruly hair like he's fashionable now. And mm. I just think, you know, um, somewhere along the line, he's had a physical glow up, but he's also mm. kind of progressed as a person. And I, I think that Maybe the Renault experience, you know, a lot of people were saying, oh, you know, the Renault have broken Daniel. But actually, I think it's added a new facet to his personality because people can see that, in a way, that kind of side to him that says, oh, I'm having fun, I'm enjoying myself. It's kind of a defense against how he could feel, isn't it? It could be. I mean... Like myself and a lot of people I know, you use kind of comedy in the darkest times, you know, to kind of make light of a situation. And with Daniel, um, like when I when I first started watching Formula One, he was in a race winning car. He was actually winning races. He was a top contender for, you know, I mean, like. There, there was a chance like he had actual like title winning chances you know because he was with a team with a car that could do that he was I imagine he was definitely he had definitely gotten used to that and but at the same time you know Red Bull are they are banking a lot on Max you know they are it's no secret um and I mean, who really knows what went on in Red Bull, you know, and everything, but it just goes to show that Daniel doesn't want to be complacent either. He wants that challenge. He wants to see can he always, like, better himself again. And to take that challenge with a team like Renault, who, like, they're... they're, mm, I mean, last year was, like... Like, yeah, with, with Renault, I, I'll i be honest, I had known a whole bunch. I had known they, they were back in Formula 1 only kind of fairly recently. I think it was a five, maybe six years, you know. Um, but he did, you know, he did... I kind of had a feeling if it wasn't with Red Bull, he was going to go to Renault. I did have that as like that was going to be his second option. Hmm. So it was both a surprise and not a surprise at the same time. Um, but yeah, um, he wants to improve. He wants to see, can he make a difference? He wants to see, can he grow with a team? You know, because I, I, I do feel like Max was getting like a preference. And like, he is, you know, that that is just how it is. Like Red Bull, they are my favorite team, but... With a love-hate relationship because, you know, just all the haste decisions they make, you know, they let go of uh, Jev, they let go of Pierre and, like, other drivers, Danny Kvyat, you know. The thing about Red Bull is that they are wonderful for finding top-notch talent, Mm. but how they manage them is extremely poor. And it's possible that Daniel felt like he was never going to grow out like he he the thing is he had like a choice he could have possibly he could have stayed with red bull now he could have been winning races but he could have stayed in a stagnation where he not actually win a title and you want to like you want to try and make that extra step so he saw Renault growing and of course there was the whole engine change as well obviously like you know, that probably would have played a big factor into his choice as well. Mm. A little bit of familiarity is good, but at the same time, he he did want to grow and he does want to grow. And as you were saying, you know, 
he did mature as a person there were a couple of silly things like he has done you know when he first started out and whatever kind of, you know but he's always owned up to them he's apologized he's always been very blunt about things like that you know so he can accept his downfalls as well and last year was I think a good sobering I think he's even said that himself honestly it was a bit of a sobering thing you know he really wants to work hard now for this and it was ultimately it was a weird year in many ways I wouldn't just say just for him and the Reynolds situation but in terms of motorsport in general and um Mm. I suppose just to say it like I hate bringing it up but uh Antoine Huber he was super focal yeah about that um you know he was extremely mature and his thoughts were extremely valid um you know about it, it, it's it's a weird one you know he he, yeah. he 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 can get so angry and yeah he had every right to be angry and he just carries on and does his best you know and i do hope the best now for Renault this season you know they had there was a lot they went through um you know they had that whole break bias thing you know and it was like oh, oh god you know could that have disqualified them and they were kind of taking knockbacks here and there and of course well, we have the CEO of Renault that is like on the run from Japan now <laughs> it's like what the, what the hell is going on I, I forget know, his I name know. but you know it's like they're dealing with that and yet he's just like I'm gonna try my best now this season so yeah that's yeah he, he is just admirable for that. that that is why I love him a lot you know so again sorry if I'm like rambling <laughs> No, no, don't uh, apologise. To... Um, it's it's uh, really good. Um, hmm. And um, I, I want to go back to something you talked about there, which is Red Bull breaking hmm. its drivers. I, I think this is something fairly uncontroversial now. So hmm. many people have noticed it. And um, one person you mentioned who was definitely for a while broken by the Red Bull system was uh, jean Eric Verne, Jev. Now... Um, mm. w- when he first came to Formula E, uh, I, I have on good authority that, um, you know, he wasn't enjoying being a racing driver. And um, mm. uh, I, I feel like now watching the documentary on the Formula E channel and uh, watching him give interviews after races, he seems to be in, in a better place. And I wonder, you know, does it make it easier or more difficult to draw somebody with clearly that many dark recesses to their personality compared to a happy-go-lucky fun character like Daniel Ricciardo because uh, if you if you put them on a sort of a um, you know um, a, 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 a kind of a one to zero spectrum of binary really happy or really sad yeah. Daniel is somewhere towards the one. He's somewhere towards the happy mm. about most things. And Jev is probably closer to the zero in terms of thinking deeply about things, isn't he? Yeah. Does that make him harder to draw, harder to paint? Um. Oh, goodness. Um, not at all. Honestly, it's just... Um, I, I'll be completely honest with you. I have had an image in my head for quite a while that I've actually wanted to draw of him and that I am going to do as part of my lovely livery brand. I actually want to make it into a shirt. Uh, Back to that though. um, I suppose um, like oh when I got into F1 you see it it was like I was coming to realize all the other like motorsport series that there were you know like it was it was like a shock like you know oh oh there's formerly e, and even though like i actually had heard of it before like there's gp2 and formula 3 and there's WEC and indycar and i suppose when i was hearing about all these different series i was getting kind of whiplash into like what one should i actually get into you know what one <laughs> should i actually try and pull attention to like my boyfriend and my friends they love IndyCar and they love the Indy 500 and I will happily not be ashamed to say I first watched it because of Alonso you know not not gonna lie there uh but it did help me actually 
uh, follow, like, I know the drivers. I actually know some of the drivers. Like, I, I had heard of Takuma Sado before, mm. stuff like that. So it did help. Um, with Formula E, I was, uh, I remember trying, like, I was slowly, it was kind of a bit of a slow burn. It, like, it's a slow burn with IndyCar, but it was a slow burn with Formula E as well. I do remember watching a full race um, in 2018 on YouTube, one of the full races they put up on YouTube. I mm. think it was, I think it was Hong Kong. I think it was one of the races there. Okay. Um, was it was it the one was it the one where Sam and Andre went into each other, or was it the one from the season before that? I think it was the one with Sam and Andre because I do, I do remember hearing a lot about Sam Bird. Uh, like when I remember watching that race now, because I tell you now, like it was over a year now since I watched it, but yeah, I think it was that one, and it just came to me. Like, I was like. This is mental. Like this is just crazy. Like what they're they're actually going through. Like these tracks are they can be narrow. They're yeeting into each other constantly. And I was like, this is great. Oh my god, this is amazing. But um, again, because like I was so preoccupied with F one, I would often forget about like trying to catch the other series as well. So like I kind of neglected IndyCar and FE. Um, but I did watch the season finale in New York 2018 live and seeing Sean Eric Fern had won it. And I was like, oh, this is great, you know. Mm. And it was it was from then that I was like, I'm going to try commit myself to watching more Formula E. And I did my first proper whole season was season five. And that was that was great fun. Oh my god, season five was great. Now I didn't get to see some of the very later races, and I was in Silverstone for last year, the the, t- the title finish. But uh, with Sean Eric Fern, in terms like because because of just having that year to kind of fully like i my my knowledge about all the series was ever growing and more so again thanks to my friends and my boyfriend you know they were all sharing me basically filling me in on the stuff i didn't know like knowing like when chev was with red bull like he outscored ricardo easily like um when he first joined you know he he was fantastic and and weirdly enough i never got the story as to why Helmut Marco dropped him was it because of Max or was it for something else? Um, that was in a period when I wasn't watching much motorsport, mm. but uh, looking back, I think um, it was just really a kind of uh, balance of risk and reward in that uh, uh, Max and I think. Carlos Sainz as well at the time were, uh, mm. you know, a bit, the, that generation of driver were coming up through the system and, you know, in the kind of inverse to what we have now, mm. um, there were too many drivers and not enough seats and somebody had to mm. pay. But uh, w- what made it worse, and I didn't realise this until recently, was um, Jev and the other Red Bull drivers at that time uh, weren't actually permitted to have management contracts. So uh, eff- effectively, they were sort of n- not signing up on a handshake, but, you know, they were signing a contract with Red Bull and Red Bull were their managers. And, you know, you can imagine that uh, that's a very similar system to how Alex Ferguson would um, sign his young players at Manchester United when he was manager. And... Um, then would just assume that they would sign again because, you know, uh, what else are they going to do? And, um, you know, so you can imagine for a young driver dropped into the world of Formula E with um, having really never had to think about where he's going to drive. Um, that must have yeah. been quite difficult. Absolutely. I, I hadn't realised that now about the management system for Red Bull. Like, that's... That's not giving drivers a security. And I I know like Max and Sainz were coming up through the ranks, but I still feel they should have like seen, you know, like Ricardo, he won 
in his he won races like in his first season with Red Bull. Jev then came to the scene and Jev outscored Ricardo. How they didn't bank on the combination of Ricardo and Jev to stay and to nurture that is beyond me when the results were actually there. So absolutely to me that just seems like Jev I mean again I can't speak for him but it must have felt like like he's doing all he can he's actually delivering good races and yet he's just dropped suddenly like he's disposable and of course that that will shatter anyone that will shatter anyone and it's like it's like it's a thing that's rampant in everything but definitely in Formula 1 it's like the drivers are getting a lot younger these days like they're they're barely 18 by the time like they've probably signed the contract or as a test driver or whatever but like it's not it, it should it shouldn't be any harm to like focus on i don't know drivers who are probably like still 25 at the time or whatever you know when they first join you know because they they're technically not still even in their peak yet you know they it might take until they're 28 29 to be in their peak so absolutely. And Jeff probably thought, I mean, because no, I don't know. Again, I can't speak for Jeff. It's just when I was first looking into Formula E and hearing opinions and everything, a, 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 a lot of people viewed it negatively. You know, they did and some mm. still do. And it's a god awful shame, you know, that it, it kind of had a reputation of like, the F1 graveyard, you know, if if you couldn't yeah. stay in F1, you're just kind of dumped there. And maybe Jev had that in his mind as well. And that can't be good for your psyche. But in actuality, what he's probably come to realize now is that he he's pretty much now like the face, the champion face of a series that in the long run, like Formula One are even going to try play catch up with because this is a, a serious issue of our time, like the climate change, you know, mm. like change has to be made in some way or another. Electric vehicles are definitely going to be the norm. Like I imagine the next like 100 years, you know, we like we, we won't be able to rely on petrol, fuels, things like that. We might get alternative fuels, I don't know maybe me say maybe we can power cars on poop i don't know but you know like it, it, <laughs> like like he has now gathered this following and like oh my god like it's it's good for the sponsors as well because like so many sponsors like they're trying to go green and they they want that green image and it's like oh yeah well now we've teamed up with formula e champion sean eric fern you know and like like he He's like Mr. Formula E now, you know, so like out of the depths of like, you could say his cold winter formed a beautiful spring for him. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, w what a suave, sophisticated man. He's um, able to mm. a a able to sell uh, Amologato watches now. Um, mm. if, you <laughs> if, if you're listening, guys, I'd, I'd love one of the Tachita ones, but, uh, you know, I'm not going to push you. <laughs> Um, you can know, I, um, can I have a tag hour, please? <laughs> exactly. Th thumb, thumb, thumbs up and a grin. But um, no, so Jev is a great character. Um, mm. And we were kind of going through uh, some of the other characters that could make a great cartoon character from mm. Formula E. Um, I think of Alexander Sims as the world's most archetypal estate car dad. Um, yeah. And I think that there's there's so much potential there, and we we were talking about this on Thursday, but so much potential in terms of uh, you know, oh sorry, Jeff, I can't go out tonight. I'm taking the kids to Wacky yeah. Warehouse. You should join us. That kind of thing. <laughs> Chuck E. Cheese or something or Leisureplex or I I just had a thought that came into my mind. No, I haven't. Uh, I haven't actually watched a Gretzko, and I should have, but like. I'm thinking of Alexander Sims as like a salary man in Japan. So, you know, he's just like, he's there like at his desk all day. You know, he's he's just out, you know, in his suit. He's just wearing a suit, going hmm. about his work. And at night then he's just coming, you know, 
for a little glass of sake or whatever, you know, just <laughs> something like that. But then on the weekends, he can like let loose. And he's like, yeah, I can drive at races, something like that. You know, it's not, oh, oh I'm busy during the week. Can't get home until one o'clock at night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know, just something very silly like that. Yeah. But yeah, he, he would be that. He definitely would. <laughs> Uh, because here's the thing um i react to setbacks as a freelancer worse than alexander sims reacts to being yeeted into the wall in formula oh. e race. <laughs> it's it's oh crazy God. when when he comes on the radio and he says uh yeah i think my left tire is loose but i'll carry on and see if it will see if it uh, see if i can shake it off and i'm thinking this this guy has just <laughs> probably had his heart up at 130 and it doesn't sound like it um i don't no. know what's going on there Oh no! Um, it's like, it's like everything is breeze from. He just, God, he could be more relaxed than Daniel Ricciardo. Who actually knows? He's just like, my God, he just carries on with it. Maybe is he like, like the quintessential, uh, person embodiment of keep calm and carry on? Maybe I don't know, but like, Jesus, fair play to him. Like. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but also his his teammate Maxi Gunter. I uh, can't call him Maxi mm. anymore. Uh, his teammate Maxi. Maxi- <laughs> His teammate Maximilian Gunter, Max Gunter, um, is he's evolved. Uh, yes, yeah, so he he is the latest um, uh, superstar of Formula E, having taken his mm. first win. But he's mm. been around for a while now, and mm. uh, people have uh, he's he's kind of been the hipster fans' favorite for some time. But do you think of him as? kind of a Lando Norris, Alex Albon bracket, kind of easily cartoonable young driver? He could be at the moment now, because like, I've like, I know he's had like trouble with like getting seats and stuff. So like he was dropped and they brought him back and there, there was all that, you know, nonsense. And like, he, he's very deserving of a seat, you know, because he, he has been good and he's been around for a while. But because of this snow, uh, in my mind, um, and I, I kind of just said it there with evolution. I'm seeing him as a Pokemon. Um, <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, so here we go. Um, so you have uh, Maxi, which is uh, the the starter. Then he falls into Maximilian, the the race winner. Uh, and then when he eventually becomes world champion, he'll be oh god, what's a, what's oh what's better than Maximilian? Um, not Maxwell. Maxwell sounds dumber than Maxwell. <laughs> Massimiliano. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Something more, something more grand, anyway. But yeah, he has his three poker evolutions and Maxi Billion. Uh, Maxi, B- there you go, there you go. Because he's in the money. He's in the mm. money when he wins. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and actually, talking about Pokemon. Um, you presumably saw the pictures of the Gen 2 Evo last week when it was uh, launched mm. online by Formula E. Um, yes. For people who haven't seen it, uh, go and check the hashtag Gen 2 Evo. It's uh, well worth looking at. But essentially what they've done is, in my opinion at least, they've streamlined the current Gen 2 car. They've created more surfaces where people can advertise on, like a shark's fin mm. and like uh, a um, inward-facing rear wing and so on. Um, and they've made it look a bit more racing car like, which some people will like. Uh, I personally liked the original sort of spaceship looking car, but I can see why they've done this. Uh, but mm. the Gen- the Gen Two Evo, to me, it's not a big change from the Gen Two. But is it comparable? Do you think to Pikachu becoming Raichu <laughs> in that it's that electric Pokemon taking the next step? What do you think? <laughs> oh goodness. Um... I would say with the the shark tail, yeah, because you know uh, Raichu has that really spiky kind of uh, thunderbolt looking tail. So in that regards, yeah, I would say so. Even though, um, like, and I I got a picture of it there now again because like I knew what it looked like. It's just I really have to take in the fact that oh, like I I don't know how to feel about the rare wing. I know it's like on the current car, it is kind of like it dips down. It kind of has like this V shape, but that feels so much like streamlined, in my opinion, to now the Gen 2 Evo. There's like, there's like a cut. It's just like a straight cut in the middle, like a gap. And I'm like, "Mm, mm," like that. my kind of like um, 
design tendencies are kind of like nagging at me in my brain when I see it because I was like, no, make it into that nice, those swooping curves of like the current car, you know, you have that gentle fee going into the back, making it aerodynamic. What's the straight cut happening? You know, it's like, give me the design. I want to design it again. Let me do it. Uh, but, um, um, yeah, kind of like the, uh, the, the shark fin. It's all right. Like, I don't mind it too much. I didn't really mind it too much on like the F1 cars either. But yeah, absolutely. As you say, like, it's it was kind of important too because like FE is getting bigger every year. More sponsors, more people are going to want their stuff on the car. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it is definitely an evolution. I hope someday it will kind of merge the best elements out of both versions of the car. Now, I'm I'm no engineer or aerodynamicist or whatever, but I, like, if you were to tell me now, gunpoint, Gen 2 or Gen 2 Evo, like, I would say just a regular Gen 2, hmm. but they're, like, like, looking at it from the side of Gen 2 Evo, it is, it is nice. It is nice. Yeah, the I don't mind not having like the hubcaps around the two front uh, tires. It's it it does make it kind of more. Oh, okay. I don't know. I'm kind of kind of stuck between the two now. Yeah, I do like the spaceship of the current one. Dang it! I'm I, I'm re- I'm really like can't make up my mind. But yeah, who knows? Maybe like maybe they'll make. Uh, something after the evil and like may- maybe it will combine all the best of two yeah. cars uh who knows um I, I want to ask a very specific question uh were you ever a fan of um the japanese cartoon speed racer and did you like the movie made by the Wachowskis? oh yes um no i never watched the cartoon but i saw the movie once many moons ago and i loved it i loved it uh just because like I love when movies are purposely made like with just these fantastical like graphics and kind of really fictional settings and like they go out of their way to try and recreate that world in a kind of a realistic medium like there's a ton of graphics and stuff but I I loved it for that it was great it's it's long been over Juno to watch again but yeah it's Good fun. Because um, I I wrote um, I wrote a post on my uh, on on the Motion E Patreon site about how um, Formula E takes the best cues not from other motorsports, which are you know as you said before um, lagging behind in presentation a little bit, but from video mm. games and mm. um, in a way the criticisms that people who don't like Formula E. Uh, have are that it's too much like a video game which were the exact same criticisms people have had of the film speed race when it came out in i think 2007 and i'm th- i'm just thinking you know there are so many comparisons to be made you know speed racer uh when it was made it was deliberately oversaturated with technicolor and mm-hmm. it um pe- people said it was like uh it was like being slapped in the face by skittles um and <laughs> Um, you know, um, there were all these really bright yellows and oranges and greens. And then there was this, uh, you know, bright white car with the covered wheel arches that actually probably the Gen 2, the original design, took a lot of inspiration from the Speed Racer car. And I'm just wondering um, how how much scope for a caricature or a cartoon could there be from making formula e look more like speed racer um you know this is a challenge i'm laying down to you Haley. um is this something you thought about could you do it oh okay i i I like this i like this because first of all um okay sorry i'm gonna cough one second sorry excuse me um but there's a lot to unpack about this because first of all i'm like to the people that are complaining that it's like a video game, they're probably the same people that are playing like Burnout or Need for Speed and stuff like that. And it's like, why don't you like this in real life? Like, you know, it's, like it's cool. We're getting like more off the wall race than action now in real life. And I've heard that too, like the complaints about Formula E being a bit gimmick 
risky like with the fan boost and attack mode and things like that but i think attack mode is fantastic all right if it's a gimmick so what i don't care it makes it look like i'm watching a real life f-zero race and like oh my god they sound like f-zero cars too and like that that's a great video game so it's like that's a win-win for me uh god like that like there, there is so much potential there. I, I know Formula E, whoever, bless the social media guy, uh, who makes those videos like putting Minecraft and Mario Kart <laughs> and Dragon Ball Z. Like, I love the Dragon Ball Z one because I'm like, yeah, can we actually have the cars shoot um, Kamehameha's? Like, uh, eventually that would be sick. But, um, like, did, did, I, I don't get why i i am a very like obviously as an artist i'm a very visual person and i look a lot for aesthetics and things like that and with the way the formula is going they have so much to play around with and currently they are doing that like in terms of the car um like there's oh there there is so much more potential to that they can do i mean that god i just remembered that pyramid was that San, no not santiago where was it the uh, rich uh I'll, I'll, no rich yeah was that the first race Diria. Diria, Diria. why right. was i saying rich i was getting mixed up yeah that pyramid like looked like a spaceship pyramid where they had the podium and everything oh, like it's yes, crazy yes. yeah mm. that was the one i was trying to think of like it it's so cool they should just not hold back i think with the presentation and things like that because like fish, making things visually appealing is like the number one sign for me anyway of liking something like if it has like really good art direction colorful if it fits the mood then absolutely like i'm all for it and like with like racing like movies like speed racer and there's like other racing anime as well like there's initial d speed racer had like a a kind of an up-to-date anime in the 90s too you know when they're just kind of Hmm. crazy like why not bring that like childlike imagination into real life racing i mean okay that doesn't mean like make it into a debt match obviously you know because like we we want to work on making it safer but uh formula e definitely have a good idea about it like in terms of their marketing in terms of the cities they want to go to and in terms of how they're doing the setup they are definitely thinking more outside the box than what formula one indycar WEC are doing you know because uh a lot of people uh, like a lot of the fans are young for formally like there's there's obviously older fans as well like but you know they are more in touch with what like the new generation of fans kind of want and like we're we're either like all nerds or we're all bts fans you know so it's like <laughs> <laughs> they have that down they have that down um for me now i would love i would actually love now this is like way later possibly spoilers way later i've not actually said this like publicly it would be cool if i could do like a parody so sequel where she's in formula e or a non-trademarked brand electric type racing sport because i I know i know f one's like trademarked and i have used f1 in the comics please liberty don't don't sue but uh you know it's um it, it would be really cool and like yeah you you oh, there, definitely there, there is so much potential in fact, yes in, in fact um I, i'm always up for uh writing fun things so there's a game uh called power drift it's an old yes. 80s yes you know I it. so you, drift, yes so you know some of the tracks they kind of go up and like they look kind of like roller coasters like they're kind of they kind of go up and around and maybe a tiny bit of banking like yeah stuff like that would be 
it is uh it's 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 an anime version of uh of, of the hot wheels car loops isn't it yeah pretty much pretty much that like um and um, p- people are constantly saying, and in fact, Daniel Ricardo was saying uh, on uh, Trevor Noah's show the other day, uh, you know, Trevor Noah asked him the question, which everybody always asks racing drivers, is it true you can drive your car, car upside down in a tunnel? And the answer is always theoretically yes, but I'm not trying it. Wouldn't it be mm. great if drivers had to try it? Well, I tell you, you know, that's something they can also get from Mario Kart 8 with the anti-gravity we get anti-gravity informally in the next 10, 20 years. My God, that's going to be a spectacle. Please make it happen. <laughs> well, and um, also, I'm just thinking, I obviously, you know, Tiffany is, uh, I, can, can, can we assume that she's, uh, she's a ghost in the shell type? She's a cyborg in some way? <sighs> that's spoilers. That's right, spoilers, spoilers. Stuart. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So, no, no. Um, so um, I'm, I'm just, uh, that was just a fan theory I threw out. But mm. um, so if we don't know that part, then could we possibly have um, uh, yeah. Robo Race, for those who don't know, is a racing series involving uh, robotic cars, um, as in artificial intelligence cars that are, you know, controlled uh from the pit lane ostensibly but uh are effectively responsible for their own actions and um they're they're based on lmp3 chassis uh but yes um a a, i I think robo race is ripe for a cartoon series it would absolutely i mean you could like um i've always been a fan too of like robot characters that are very you know they have developed like their own full personality that's actually to to go slightly off topic but that's another important character i created over 10 years ago too is is a character based on my old dog my old yorkshire terrier but he's a robot uh because duh at this point um but he's also uh, a police dog in outer space, and his name is Space Officer Triggs. And he is, yeah, he is like this anthropomorphic robot Yorkshire Terrier. Uh, so, like, I just have this thing for, like, sometimes the robotic characters and things, when they have their own personality, they can be the most emphasizing characters in fiction because it's like they've they've kind of come to understand the flaws of humans and they they feel so they're so idealistic and it's like when their world tears down or whatever and they have to know like the truth about you know why humans do this or you know that and then they, they like freak out or they're sad you feel for them it could be really heartbreaking with cars oh, oh wait hold on disney picks our cars damn it no, no, no. Damn. I mean, um, <laughs> D- Disney Pixar Cars was was a yeah. different concept. So yeah, that, uh, yeah, that, yeah. That, that that was just taking the world and mm. saying, what if the world were entirely cars? Which is mm. moderately terrifying if you think about it. <laughs> because does that mean cars can give birth? Uh, and does d- does that does that mean that um, when you get a car serviced, it's effectively on an operating table, and you get to all these questions that mm. maybe maybe Pixar were not intending to raise in roughly the same way that. Um, Oh gosh, I forget. Um, probably Detective Pikachu actually raised mm. the question of: so are Pokemon actually slaves when they're caught by trainers? You know, yeah. it, um, it, and so there there are these questions. But have you ever seen the '90s cartoon with the greatest theme tune of every of any TV show ever, uh, Captain Bucky O'Hare? I have. N- I know. Bucky O'Hare. I've hmm. just not actually seen. I'm familiar with the game as well, but I have there not was a game. seen. Uh, apparently, the what it was, uh, yeah, by Konami. I think it was oh, like, right. um, I think it was a side-scrolling shooter type, like Contra. I'm not sure, but yeah. Well, there well was of course. A game. Of course, they of course they suffered because you know, mm-hmm. um, because the Bucky O'Hare concept was done best by Nintendo in Star Fox, wasn't it? Ooh. 
that I wasn't sure because honestly, I wasn't sure how it began. Was it either a cartoon first or a comic book first? Uh, I can't remember, honestly. I mean, they might have been. Well, I, taken I, from. As, as far as I know, it was a case of they both came up with the idea of you know, anthropomorphic animals in space separately. But mm. hey, guys, there's no copyright on ideas, is there? No, not really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, pretty much. Um, but Star Fox, you mm-hmm. mentioned um, as being an inspiration. Um, w- what is it about the idea of anthrop- anthropomorphic animals um, in any situation that elevates elevates the story, do you think? It's... Uh... It's it's more of an aesthetic thing in a way, but also kind of when you combine that with like the actual animal traits, like the traits of certain animals, in terms of like both designing the character and developing the character's personality to go with the story, you can come up with some really unique characters as opposed to humans. So like I, I suppose I'll take my example of of Triggs. Um, like my old Yorkie, like he was no, he, he was mostly a slob, like just lazy, whatever. But he was also quite hyper too and just very lovable. And he hated water, he hated taking baths and things like that. So like some of those quirks I can already put into that character. But at the same time, kind of like taking the look of my dog and exaggerating it to kind of turn it into a cool action character whose design you've probably not seen anymore. So there's like a lot of room to develop like brand new creatures and characters. I mean, Sonic the Hedgehog got it down to a T. Like he is without a doubt the best designed character like ever and i'm not even saying that because i'm biased or anything like he is for the purpose he serves for the game as well his aerodynamic like his his spines and everything you know it gives him already the sense of speed he has the red shoes to contrast with his mostly blue body and then it's very weird uh the creation of him because when they designed the when they designed the personality concept for Sonic, and I quote, they wanted to give him the go to attitude of Bill Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> this was in yeah. the early nineties, wasn't it? Yes, yes, yes. I must stress that. Um, but it's weird. It was like, yeah, give him the go to attitude of Bill Clinton and give him Santa Claus shoes. There you go. You have a you have a record selling character. <laughs> and in fact, um, you must look this up on YouTube if you haven't seen it. There is a comedy sketch uh, where these three guys in a room imagine what it must have been like at the brainstorming meeting at Sega. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, it, it, have you have you seen it? So there's this guy screaming blue murder about uh, how you know they've been locked in this room for three days and they still haven't come up with the character and they're not coming out until they do and um uh, and, and then right at the end um you know they've clearly got the character of sonic and the guy says um okay and what's the name gonna be and um uh, this most timid and meek guy with the glasses says mr needle mouse <laughs> Yes, that is what he was called in the prototypes. I don't think I've seen that actually. Oh, I'll have to look that up. Um, but yeah, he was. Uh, that was his um, name before they got a proper name. They just called him Mr. Needlemouse. And he also had a human girlfriend named Madonna. Uh, we never saw the light of day because mm. someone at Sega America was like, tone it down, no, that, that's too raunchy now altogether. You can't be doing that. Uh, you know, so it was uh, the fun you, times. Like, <laughs> Just a little bit too close as well to asking the questions that Roger Rabbit asked, which is, uh, <laughs> so if you have an animal with a human girlfriend, what happens there? <sighs> so it can either go one or two ways, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Either it's either it's an animal or a human, or it's like in Shrek, you get these weird donkey dragon hybrids. <laughs> That's what I think. Oh yeah. god. Yeah. 
But th- this this is why cartoon is such a great medium because you can mm. imagine these things and there's there's no there's nothing that is over budget there's nothing where people can say oh no you can't do that because you know Mm. sure you know if you work for a big publisher you might have to tone things down but in your mind and on Mm. your drawing tablet you you are you are you know um, master and commander of this aren't you pretty much like the biggest spectacle is only limited by what you can imagine and visualize in your head and like it just some of the stuff that you can come up with like I, I i would often like just 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 in general anyway like i i daydream and imagine you know scenes from my comic or scenes i would like to see and just inspired by like um what i think would look cool or what would look like heroic and things like that and i'm sure this idea has been passed around like a couple of times but it's like i've had an idea like before where like in a racing series be it f1 or fe or whatever but all the drivers are also secretly working for like this big world defense team so like not only not only are they out there like every race weekend trying to win and things like that but the technology that each team are trying to you know that they're developing for their cars is also work that's going in for like this earth defense force so like their technology say are being used for like let's say gundams like you know the, the mm. big mecha machines mm. and things like that and the drivers also pilot them and then they're just fighting aliens like i i love combining things like that like where you have the race inside of it and then you kind of wow what if i can turn this into like a big save the world kind of thing as well you know be like save the world through the power of motorsport kind of thing like i don't know it's, i i oh. think i think i know of a formula e fanfic that you need to read um <laughs> I'll, I'll send you Ooh. the link at some point oh please do because uh, the, the the idea of racing drivers having a um, parallel, more important career, yes, it's uh, it's 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 something that um, I think multiple people have thought of. Uh, mm. Your idea is very original there, but uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Um, it, but uh, other people have had not the same idea, but something yeah. that might contribute to what you're talking about. Mm, no, definitely, I would be well interested in that. Like, yeah, I I imagine. I, I'm not the only one that's thought of that, but you know, it, it is still really cool to think about, you know. So, and oh, it's definitely. like, yeah, why hasn't there been like a movie done on this before or something, you know? And instead of like making the, these documentaries, just do it, like, make. <sighs> I think we're living um, in a, I think we're living hmm. in a time now where for the first time really since the 1970s, motorsport is seen as something that is viable viable to make films about now um mm. um obviously there were there were, there was a lot of toing and froing about making a potential formula one movie in the 90s in the end it turned into um the sylvester stallone um uh rotten tomatoes apocalypse driven <laughs> um which um which which has has some of the unintentionally funniest crash scenes ever um, oh god! <laughs> I, I don't know if you've seen any clips on YouTube of it, but uh, my my favourite so bad it's good scene is the one where they're on an oval and um, the young, I think French or German driver. Um, no, he's an American actually. Um, uh, he he crashes into the wall, but for some reason there's catch fencing instead of a wall, and he goes over the catch fencing and lands upside down in a duck pond um where um what? and then yeah and then catches fire all the same and um and stallone's character um drives off the track through an escape road to get to the duck pond and jumps out of the car to try and save him how would that even work god that's so silly oh god no i i have to look those up i really do like oh god hmm. As soon as a train wreck, like. Now, I I don't I don't credit Bernie Eccleston with many good decisions, but <laughs> the decision he made to not allow Sylvester Stallone to film a Formula One movie has to be credited right now. Oh wow! Was it? Oh 
oh my god, did, did he actually like stop? So or, st- yeah. st- Stallone, Stallone spent a lot of time with Bernie Eccleston trying to thrash out the details to an uh, to a movie set in the world of Formula One about uh, about. Um, uh, fictitious characters but using the real cars and mm. it, in the end it became so so labyrinthine the negotiation and so protracted that um, Stallone thought look it, this is much easier to do with cart with IndyCar so um, mm. I- in the end they got the license to use the IndyCar cars of 1998 I think it was without too much trouble oh my god oh wow that oof yeah, I don't want to credit Bernie Eccleston with anything either, but probably a good save if it was going to be that. But then, oh, poor IndyCar. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, reason, the reason I mention those movies is because, mm. you know, we've come on leaps and bounds now and we, we have a film landscape where, partly because there isn't much for middle market in films, uh, big budgets are being given to films like Ford versus Ferrari, which is about a very niche moment in motorsport history, mm. which you couldn't you couldn't have sold to many producers in the 90s but now it's getting made and i think we we are living in a time where it's much more possible to make a motorsport movie and to make it good so um i think in, in answer to your question why hasn't a film been made it's because we are living in the time right now when it could be oh like it's i i do wonder is it due to perhaps it wouldn't be down to not being able to capture it correctly because like you're technically living a lot closer to the time when those big events happened um it's a hard one to kind of think about actually because like when you like when you had those huge moments like would say you know i mean you had the big titans nikki lauda james hunt you had Mm. Prost Senna, you know, you you had th- there was such a huge global thing, and yet just for whatever reason it didn't fall through. Maybe perhaps this is probably the only thing I could actually think of. Maybe it's just what was even the point of making a movie when you're seeing it in real life, you're seeing the real life images. It's like one of the rare cases of like when real life is better than fiction you know you're you're seeing these great battles on the track you're seeing the fruits of hours of labor of people that have developed these machines to go like that across like some of the dangerous tracks you know it's it's you didn't have to like there was no budgeting for you have to get this set or that set um booked or we have to shoot at this location when it was pretty much all being done for you you Mm -hmm. know every sunday every weekend you had something cinematic but without having to go to the cinema for you were actually experiencing a real life race and but i suppose now because we are well past like those let's say golden age days of like 70s through the 90s and like vintage things are like getting more in vogue and the history of certain things like we're definitely now in a far newer epoch compared to to that so maybe now it's kind of like because you're getting the newer fans in this epoch like the the hybrid era of f1 formula e new Mm. windy car it's like through the power of now cinema they can actually for younger people people are on netflix they can now like actually want to make these films to let the younger new generation know in kind of a more abridged format that's probably why these movies are happening now i would imagine because we we are in two distinct separate eras of like motorsport in general and uh my like what i really want to ask too is like well not even ask is actually just say i think because of this it's it's gonna be so soon maybe who knows but like 
I will be surprised if we don't eventually get a movie of the autobiomelly. Well, you know, th this is something that could be possible. Um, I, I think that um, in my mind's eye, I see it as... And th this is intended as um, a virtue of Job Josh's book and not as a criticism of it, because mm. um, I, I think it lends itself so much to that kind of parallel universe where things might have happened. So I mm. see it as an animated movie. But what do you think? Ooh. Ooh. Good question, actually. Um. You could, I, thing is, it's, that's a hard one actually, because I can see a live action version so easily in my head and scrolling through my mind was like, what would be an appropriate animated art style for an animated autobiomelly movie i know i drew the cover of it and i knew i know i drew his head pretty dang big but at the same time it would have to be approached with an art style that boat knows that it's it's written from a person a person who has done their research who is very dedicated to the striver like legitimately loves the striver and it is done with such respect and you know the, there is so much respect but at the same time fully aware it's a bit it's a bit of a meme and because of that it's the word of Bruno Giacomelli has grown tenfold from it so it would have to be an art style that appreciates the respect and the legacy but also slightly comical not too much to disrespect it a little bit slightly comical maybe well look i mean in, in a way what mm. what is i'm and again i'm, I'm not i'm not uh, comparing um, anyone to bruno giacomelli here but <laughs> what you know the, the autobiomelli yeah. is is as well, okay, it's probably better researched than the Bible in terms of if you wrote down the Bible and parts of it were um, metaphorical, then who's to mm. say? But we know that everything in Bruno Giacomelli's life happened because we can we can fact check it. It's true. You can and, fact check it, yeah. Yeah, and, 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 you know, this is a rigorously researched biography of a man who is still alive so mm. in in some ways yeah it, it's it's a marvelous work of research but it is also a fabulously written story as well it really is i i think what we're coming to here Stuart, is that is bruno giacomelli bigger than jesus and how marketable now can we make him I think to um, avoid being besieged by uh, angry evangelical Christians, yeah, I might my, play my the apologies. Fifth on that one. Yeah, no, my no, no, apologies. No. It, it's a really great question, and I suspect uh, I suspect that will be the quote to go on the social media bit for this podcast. Actually, <laughs> so um, so Josh, if you'd like to answer that question, then um, please do in the uh, updated edition of the Autobiomelly. But just to just to row back, because we did talk about the Autobiomelly in the last podcast, so um, mm. hopefully listeners know a bit about it. But this is the biography of the uh, former Formula One driver Bruno Giacomelli, who was active in the late 70s and early 80s in F1. And it's written by Josh Wilcock, who is a... Um, really active member of the Formula One online community uh, and the Formula E online community as well. And um, he really stepped up to the plate with this. Uh, people thought, yeah, but, you know, you're not going to take this far enough to write and write a biography about your favourite driver. And he did. He wrote, well, close on to um, 
27, 30,000 words about him. Mm-hmm. And um, it's a fabulous piece of work. But what did you think and how did you feel when you were asked to illustrate the cover for this? I'm going to be completely honest. I offered to Josh to draw it because I was like, you mad git, you are actually doing this and putting so much work. Can I, like, I I want to do it, like, for the crack. And he was like, oh my God, yeah, cool. That, like, he, he was just like, I would love that. And I was like, I, yeah, I, I, I actually just want to do it. So when I did, now, you like, when you see the cover, you, you do notice that it's a bit of a mishmash of my usual kind of caricature take on people, but mixed in with some... Uh, so I kind of pretended that like a five-year-old drew over it in crayon as well, uh, just to kind of like to kind of capture the essence of like where this whole thing came from. Like, yes, Josh has a great love and a great respect for the greatest driver in the world who came third in the Caesar Palace Grand Prix, but also fully aware and he has committed to a bit for so long. So you have to put in a bit of humor into it. So that that's kind of where my thoughts you came back for like what kind of animated style would a autobiomelly cartoon take. So that was it. And when I was showing him what I was doing, he was just, I love it. I love it. And I was like, thank you. And of course, font selection had to go with the Caesar Palace font. Had to do it. That was legitimately (laughs) his crowning moment. So that's how that all worked out. (laughs) Well, I I think that um, I think that you you really encapsulated the spirit of the book with that illustration and well done. And, uh, you know, thank you for, thank you for stepping up and offering to do it. Um, um, we've come all this way and we haven't talked about the thing, which I actually, um, set out to talk to you about, which is your new range of, um, illustrations, lovely livery, which, um, is available to buy. So, um, t- tell us a bit about the Haley Mulch online store and how how people can access it and what people can get and what is lovely livery as well. So, uh, you know, take us through that. Alrighty, I will take you through lovely livery first of all. So, it was a bit of a brainchild I had at the end of last year. People do know me for making and selling uh, mostly Formula One merch online, but I wanted to kind of make a separate thing, but actually making like t-shirts, accessories, and of course, Redbubble is like you know, it's a it's a good platform in order to make all those without spending a massive budget on your own printing costs. So I set up shop there, and the intent is that I just want to make really nice designs, honestly, designs I just want to see of my favorite drivers that like you wouldn't see anywhere else. Like I like I do love the official merch and stuff, but at the same time, I always wanted something a bit more unique and out there, and that's what li- lovely livery is. So, like, I will draw drivers in my usual caricature anime esque style, which I have. I do just currently have one design up at the moment, uh, inspired by Jensen Button's uh, return to Monaco 2017. It's him and Alonzo, and Alonzo's just saying, Jensen, my friend. So it's inspired by that. So you can get that. And there are more designs on the way. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to let you know. I'm going to let you know what those designs are right now. Uh, so you can look forward to them. I mentioned earlier, I wanted to do a, a Jev design. So that is going to be something I will be working on soon. Basically, Jev with a cheetah. Want to make it quite cute, but also really cute at the same time. So I'll be developing that soon. Um, I mentioned this one to you before the podcast. The cartoon Ed, Ed and Eddie. But it's 
George Russell, Alex Albon and Lando Norris <laughs> drawn in that style. Rook, rook and rookie. So that's something that's happening. And, oh, my apologies, Drew. It was just an alarm that went off on my phone. That is totally fine. Uh, final design I have in mind at the moment, which I haven't even told this to Josh. Maybe I have, actually. I don't know. But anyway, think Mario Brothers 3, that iconic box art. <laughs> super, uh, super Giacomelli Brothers 3 and it's Bruno Giacomelli. All right. Yeah. So, 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 who's who's going to be? Um, so, so, who's going to be the Luigi character? Is, is, that, <laughs> is, is that going to be a slightly taller, thinner version of Bruno? So it's the. If you've seen the the box art for Super Mario Brothers three, it's the yellow background. You had the mm -hmm. font in blue, and it's like Mario flying with the Tanuki tail and ears. So it's going to be Bruno Giacomelli with the Tanuki earring tails, <laughs> pretty much. Um, yeah. Do, do you know what? I don't imagine that Bruno Giacomelli, when he went into a life of quietly visiting pizzerias in his hometown or whatever <laughs> he's doing now, thought that anybody would do this. I, th I think he'd be over the moon if he knew about it. I hope that he does know about it. I honestly, I kind of hope he does too. Like he, he is one of the lesser known drivers that now has a substantial awareness thanks to Josh and has this great circle of people that actually know him. And like, I'm actually delighted to be drawing him now. So, you know, um, if someday... If someday he could see the autobiomelly or even see my eventual designs or the cover, I mean, I, I would just be over the moon. I would legitimately be so happy and I would hope he'd like them. I really do. Well, um, Comrade O'Keefe was saying last time, what is missing in this bit now is a meeting between Bruno and Josh. I, th I think mm. uh, it, it has to happen preferably before the second ed edition is published. I think so. Like, um, just set it up. It should actually be recorded. I think just like uh, an intimate conversation with Bruno Giacomelli. They just have like cups of coffee. Maybe they'll have like pizza next to them. Mm. Ideally, if they could actually record it at a pizzeria initially, it would be bellissimo, perfect. You know. So, but yeah. Um, God, I I hope he gets to do that someday. Actually, that would be amazing. Absolutely. Um, so where can people go if they want to buy your merch? Because I, I know that, um, you know, th this is, am I correct? This is kind of a side job. This is a side hustle right now, but it's mm -hmm. something you'd like to make your career. So uh, where can mm -hmm. people go if they want to support you and also buy some of your stuff, your stickers, your pictures and so on? Okay, so you can check out Hayley Mulch dot online web dot shop that is my main store where everything i make myself i get the prints uh made locally i um i order stickers from suppliers i hand make my badges there is a mix of kind of everything there at the moment because uh, i don't just do motorsport art i do sell at anime and uh, comic conventions around Ireland as well when I can. So like there is gaming fan art, there's anime fan art, but the motorsport stuff is starting to get more to the fore. You can get my F1 badges there. I have uh, a print of Charles Leclerc. I still have some leftover F1 key rings, but I really want to make more stuff. But at the moment, I just don't have enough money to do any printing this month. So any any bit of support would be awesome. Then lovely livery. You can go to redbubble.com forward slash Haley Mulch. That's where you can get the Ensign My Friend t-shirt. Um, and all those designs I mentioned earlier, they will be coming up uh, in the next few months, just when I can get around to making them pretty much. And I am going to be starting them. And... Um, 
I do have a coffee. I'm on coffee as well. Coffee.com forward slash Hayley Mulch and Gumroad as well. Gumroad.com forward slash Hayley Mulch. That's where you can buy digital editions of some of my art books, my sketchbooks and comics. And that's pretty much it. Oh, and if you want to check out Paradiso, Paradiso comic, uh, paradiso-comic.com. That's it. And Paradiso Comic is something that updates uh, periodically, I guess. Yeah, um, it used to have a more uh, regular schedule uh, before, but due to my full-time job and nerve damage, I it's just difficult actually keeping up um, a regular schedule. So now, while I'm doing, there is a Twitter account. I put up updates there whenever I can even if it's just like a working in progress of the next page or whatever, just to show you a quick, oh yeah, there is something currently in the works right now. So the Twitter would actually be a very good way of keeping up to date. And that's at Paradiso Comic. Well, um, Hayley McCarley, it's uh, been an absolute pleasure to spend that time with you and uh, thank you very much for agreeing to come on the podcast and talking about um, your fantastic artwork as well um, folks go and check out what she does um, she's ridiculously talented and um, I think that whatever it is that you choose to purchase you'll be very pleased with uh, pl- please also do post a photo of yourself unboxing it on social media because um, you know the, the the unboxing pictures generally are the nicest things about seeing people's interactions with Hayley um, and um, I've, I feel like much of the motorsport community has one of your stickers on their laptop now which uh, shows the <laughs> kind, kind of reach that you've had um, yeah Hayley thank you so much Thank you for listening to the Talking Podcast. Uh, Even though we do have the uh, public health crisis still happening around us, there will be plenty more content from the podcast and from Motion E coming up very, very soon. Uh, Thank you so much for listening to this and for sticking with us during this tough time for transport and for motorsports generally. All the best and stay safe and wash your hands. 